So armed with this idea, we can then measure what we're going to call consumer surplus. Consumer surplus we are going to define as the benefit a consumer gets from consuming a good above and beyond what they paid. So it's consumer benefit above the price paid. That's what we're going to call consumer surplus. The consumer benefit, OK, above the price paid. OK? So to think about this, let's do the example of my daughter and Katy Perry song. She'd be insulted now. She's much beyond Katy Perry, but the notes are a couple years old. OK? Uh, so let's do continue with my daughter and Katy Perry songs. OK? Um, suppose Katy Perry songs cost a dollar. I know they're usually $1.29 on iTunes, but imagine they're a dollar. They're a dollar on Amazon. OK? Now let's say she's willing that her willingness to pay off her demand curve for a Katy Perry song is a dollar and she can buy it for a dollar, then we say she has derived no consumer surplus. She was willing to pay a dollar, and she got it for a dollar. However, if she was willing to pay two dollars for that Katy Perry song and got it for a dollar, then she derived a dollar of consumer surplus. So to measure consumer surplus, we need two things. We need the willingness to pay, and we need the market price. Well, market price is given to consumers in a competitive market. Consumers have no influence over the price. And what's willingness to pay? Where does that come from? What, 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 what concept have we used from very early on in this course to measure willingness to pay? The demand curve. So armed with a demand curve and a price, we can measure consumer surplus. OK? So let's go to figure 13.1. Here's my daughter's demand for Katy Perry songs. Let's say that she, now this is, this is tricky because it's discrete. Really, this line should be a step function, not a line. So just bear with me. Imagine she could buy continuous shares of Katy Perry songs, you know, the little bit by Juicy J or whatever. OK? So basically, um, she gets, um, actually, it's really fascinating. So I've discovered this really cool venue. In, if you guys ever want to like get off campus, I never do as an undergrad, but if you do, in, in Olson, there's a case called the Brighton Music Hall, which is a super place to see concerts. And I go there all the time. And what's really cool about it is it's so small, you can like chat with the band. So I talked with the band, the guy, this band member, this independent band from Seattle, all about how the music business works. And basically, it, he told me all about how iTunes works and all that. And it turns out that the way you make money now in the music business is not through any of this. I mean, Katy Perry does, but like if you're not Katy Perry, Lake music, it's all through selling your songs to ads and TV shows and movies. Apparently, that's where all the money is now. That's touring, record stuff. For indie bands, that's not. So basically, this guy had sold a song to Scream 4, and so he was set. OK? So basically, it's pretty interesting. Anyway, so, um, anyway, so here's the consumer surplus. So let's say my daughter was willing to pay. This measure willingness to pay. So for the first song, she would, for the zero song, she was willing to pay $5. It's not a concept. <laughs> Let's say, oh, I see. I know where I was going with that little segue. So I asked him, how does it work with how much guys get paid? Like, I'm fascinated by this. Sort of, you see this thing featuring Juicy J or whatever. So what they do is there's actually, they don't get, when Juicy J is on the Katy Perry song, he doesn't get a percent of the song. They just pay like a fixed sum. You negotiate a fixed sum between the featuring artist and the main artist. They just pay a fixed sum. If the song turns out to be huge, then you don't, you know, basically, they, the risk on whether the song is huge is borne by the primary singer not by the featuring. The featuring gets a fixed amount. If it's too much, then the primary singer loses money. If it's too little, the featuring guy doesn't make so much money. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Anyway, OK, so back to this. So, um, so my daughter's willing to pay zero for the fifth Katy Perry song. She's willing to pay $1 for the fourth. She's willing to pay, I'm sorry, four, she's willing to pay $5 for the zeroth Katy Perry song. She's willing to pay $4 for the first Katy Perry song, $3 for the second Katy Perry song, $2 for the third Katy Perry song, $1 for the fourth Katy Perry song, and $5 for the zero, for the zero dollars for the fifth Katy Perry song. So what you see is that's her willingness to pay. The price of a Katy Perry song is a dollar. So what she will do, and what the positive analysis we've done so far, is we will say she'll buy four Katy Perry songs. 
That you should know how to do. That's the positive analysis we've done so far, which is that she um, will, would buy four Katy Perry songs at a dollar. What we haven't talked about so far is the fact that she is very happy because she only pays a dollar, but for that, first Katy Perry, for that first Katy Perry song, she was willing to pay $4. For the zeros, she was willing to pay $5. So all that area, that entire shaded triangle, is her consumer surplus. Because the she paid for the fourth song, what she was only willing to pay for the fourth song, but it was much less than she was willing to pay for the first through third songs. So she earned surplus on those songs. Okay, so consumer surplus is the amount under the demand curve above the price line. And it exists because the consumer is paying for the marginal unit. But as long as they wanted more than, more than that marginal unit, they're getting surplus in all the earlier units. Okay, so consumer surplus exists because the willingness to pay is above the price. Okay. And so the key is, once again, diminishing margin utility. If I have diminishing margin utility and my demand curve slopes down, that means I will buy when the last unit equals the price. As long as that last unit is in the first unit, that means I earn surplus on earlier units. Okay? So because my margin utility diminishes and I'm buying where the last unit equals the price, that means so if the fourth pizza is worth eight bucks to me and that's what I pay for it, and that means the first through third pizzas were worth, by definition, more than eight bucks to me. So by definition, I made surplus on it. OK? Questions about that? OK. So the bottom line is, since margin utility diminishing means that the last unit is more worth less than the first unit, then I must, by definition, make surplus on the first unit. OK, that's the logic. That's individual consumer surplus.